All right, good morning in Southwest. How y'all doing? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual tennis tournament in Indian Wells. My, my name is John Blackenroll. It's good to have you here today. Uh, seriously, welcome to Southwest. And my name is Ricky. Very glad that we get to be together to worship the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, these are those weekends where our church gets to welcome people from around the world, and we want to be very intentional to making sure that you know, whether you are from overseas or our neighbors up north in Canada, where Midwestern of these United States, thank you so much for being with us today. If the desert is not your home, but you're here to visit with us, whether for today or for a few weeks, whether church on the lawn or upstairs, would you just show it by saying, yes, I'm not from here, but I'm glad to be here. Southwest, let's do due diligence to welcome these wonderful folks who are here with us today. Now, now some of you are thinking, where are the regular people? They know not to come out in this traffic, and that's where they're, that's, that's where they're at. Uh, but a hello to everyone here in the room, to everyone at Church on the Lawn, uh, upstairs in our traditional uh, worship experience and ambassadors, we, 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 we bid you welcome, especially to our online church. Uh, you heard the vision casters talking about Easter services. I hope that you're preparing your hearts. Uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful commemoration of Good Friday on that Friday and a soul-saving cele celebration of Resurrection Sunday on Easter Sunday morning. Every year uh, around this time, sometime during the season of Lent, our entire staff team, along with ministry leaders and volunteers, uh, we hike up to the cross in Palm Desert, and we have a time of worship and communion and praying for you and for one another, and we had a sweet time this last week, and I want y'all to know I made it up to the top of that mountain nonstop in Jesus' name. I want you to know that. But would you join me in thanking God for our staff team and volunteers who have been working so hard to prepare the way? For Easter, we really appreciate them. I got a lot of fish to fry. I ain't got but a few minutes to cook it, and this is one of those sermons where I'm going to try to squeeze it into the time limit that they have given me. I will give you my word on this. I promised to be finished as soon as I get done. That is my promise. That is my promise. So if you have your Bibles, meet me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, pick me up at verses 1 through 11 as we continue in a series of study that we have embarked upon here at Southwest. We call it First Californians, Christ over culture. First Californians, Christ over culture. We're endeavoring to bring an answer every weekend to this key question. Look at it on screen with me. How do I live authentically Christian when my environment is authentically secular. And so we call it First Californians, and so far that ancient city of Corinth had a lot of similarities to this modern expression that you and I call California. Uh, case in point, if you missed last weekend, we were in chapter five where the subject matter focused upon a believer in the church who was having a sexual affair with his stepmother. And that sounds pretty Californian to me. I don't know about any of you, but anyway, that's a little crazy. But, uh, but what we learned, right, is that when one of our Christian people, our brother or sister, is in sin and refusing to come out of that sin, the best thing you and I are to do, biblically speaking, is to graciously, humbly, and patiently call out that sin and then journey along with them to their way of recovery, right? So that's what we did last weekend. This weekend, uh, whereas last weekend, Paul was telling the church what to do when one of us messes up. Uh, this weekend, Paul is telling us what to do when two of us can't get along. Let's have a conversation on lawsuits. And all the Judge Wapner fans said, <laughs> no, 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 okay, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses uh, 1 through 11. Here now, the word of Almighty God. How many of you believe that God can move through a sermon on lawsuits? I know that he can. I know that he can. The Bible says this. When one of you has a grievance against one another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge Angels, that word there is the idea of fallen angels. Think 
demons when you hear that, okay? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this, verse five, to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at the phraseology now, verse 11, Southwest, and such were some of you. My Bible says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Good morning. I've read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, and I've read from the greatest book ever written. And I bear witness this day, all of its words are true. Yes, amen. Amen? amen? Amen. So in verse 5, Paul begs the question to Christian folks here in Corinth, is there not any of you wise enough to settle disputes between Christian brothers? Translation when you come to Christ and you suffer disputes with one another, Christian folks don't settle our grievances the world's way. Our passage reminds me of a movie I saw uh, 25 uh, years ago, a movie called The Skulls. Uh, the Skulls. Uh, the movie The Skulls was a mock against secret societies at Ivy League schools. And so in this particular movie, uh, The Skulls, it's a mock-up of that infamous secret society at Yale University called Skulls and Bones. Uh, in the movie, the protagonist, a guy named Lucas McNamara, if that's not an Ivy League name, I don't know what is. But Lucas McNamara has his dreams come true, and he's recruited into that famed secret society, Skull and Bones. And his life is now forever changed. Uh, Lucas now has big money, and he's got big prestige, and he's got this big future ahead of him. And it seems now that he's in the club, it seems like nothing is ever going to go wrong for him. And of course, being a movie, that's when it happens. This explosive conflict emerges between Lucas and another member of this secret society. And what happens thereafter is that Lucas tries his best to pursue some sort of fix through conventional means. He pursues legal counsel and he uh, runs towards legal authorities. He even consults with the police and attempt after every attempt fails flat on its face. It's then that he yokes up with an older, wiser member of the club who is actually a United States senator who comes to Lucas and says, you forgot to read your rule book. Because the rule book says that our rules supersede their rules. That when you come into this club, our rules outweigh the rules of the world. Now with this newfound information, Lucas navigates his conflict according to the rules on his way towards victory and freedom and peace. Now, as we tiptoe towards our passage, there is a dispute going on between two Corinthian believers, and they are trying to settle their affairs through conventional means. Can I get a Judge Judy witness, okay? They have taken one another to court, but it, apparently it's failing, and so by God's grace, an older, wiser member of the Christian club, another senator named the Apostle Paul says, you forgot to read your rule book. And the rule book says that the rules here supersede the rules of the outside world. And in so doing, he teaches you and I how we ought to settle our affairs. 
I'd like to talk to you about lawsuits. And in so doing, I want to move through the passage through these movements, table of contents for our time. I want to talk to you about the meaning of 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11. I want to talk to you, watch this now, about the revelation behind 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11 before landing the plane with these four helpful tools, four biblical reasons why you and I shouldn't take each other to court. Yay. Okay. I'd like to tag this text, How to Settle Our Affairs. Will you pray with me? Daniel called you the ancient of days. And I heard Isaiah say that you are the rose of Sharon, and we worship you. Oh God, the great lily of the valley and the bright and morning star, even now move through hearts and minds and lives through a random passage about court. I thank you that Jesus will shine and show himself greatly in this space. We give it all to you in Jesus' name. And every heart said, amen. amen. Y'all ready to go to the classroom for a few minutes? Okay, we'll probably be there all day. Don't know if we're going to get to church. We'll see what happens. But anyways, let's sink our teeth into what the Bible has to say to us. How many know that the Bible is exhaustive? How many know that the Bible is comprehensive? How do you know that the Bible has to say something about every field of human endeavor? And 1 Corinthians 6 is one of those kinds of passages. For now, I want to talk first and foremost about the meaning of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Uh, this is what you need to really know, because when I read the passage, you knew what Paul was saying. So the first things we've got to say about 1 Corinthians 6 is that it is simple to understand. This is not rocket science, okay? Paul has basically said, if you love Jesus, don't take someone else who loves Jesus to court. It is simple, and that's what the man is saying. If you want to know what he's saying with clarity, look at verse 1. He says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? If you want crystal clear clarity... Look no further than verse 7, where Paul says to have lawsuits, look at this phraseology, at all with one another is already a defeat for you. And look at the, the audacity of his request next. He says, why not just rather suffer wrong? And why not rather be defrauded? Put your thumb there. We're going to come back to it. But my point is this. This is very simple to understand. In case you still don't understand, let me put it out plainly here on screen. Paul is teaching us, watch this church, that Christian people should not take other Christian people to court. This is what the Bible has to say. I'm going to read it again. Don't hate the messenger. Hate the message. Amen, somebody. But Christian people should not take other Christian people to court. Now, the word judge is peppered throughout chapters 5 and 6. Scholar Andrew Wilson said that the reason that the Corinthians had made a mess of things is because of an abdication of responsibility to judge their affairs Correctly. So in chapter 5, they didn't judge sin within the church. God's sleeping with a stepmama, nobody's saying anything, okay? They should have expelled him temporarily from the church. They don't do it. Now we're in chapter 6. There's a dispute going on inside of the church, and they refuse to allow that to be settled within the church, and they're taking it to a pagan court system. There is an abdication of responsibility to judge things well. So I'm just studying the other day. I'm just thinking, I wonder if there are some Christian judges who have provided commentary on our passage. And then I got to thinking when I was back in college, mine was the privilege to have dinner with the late Justice, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. We had invited him to Mississippi College. It was a lecture series. I was in student government, and I got to sit at the very table where Justice Scalia was. I was on his left. He was right there. We were tearing some of that rubber chicken up, okay? And we're having a good old conversation. And man, I'm telling you, he looks at me and he says, Ricky, how many kids do you think I have? I said, I don't know, Justice Scalia. Do you have three and four? He looks at me and says, Ricky, I got nine kids. And then I looked at Justice Scalia, and I said, that ain't nothing. I got 10 brothers and sisters, and we've been thick as thieves thereafter. We were jaw-japping and laughing and having a good old time. God rest his soul. Look at what Judge Scalia had to say about 1 Corinthians 6 verses 1 through 11. This passage has something to say about the proper Christian attitude towards civil litigation. Paul is making two points. 
Paul says that the mediation of a mutual friend, such as the parish priest, should be sought before parties run off to the law courts. I think we are too ready today to see vindication or vengeance through adversary proceedings rather than peace through mediation. Good Christians, just as they are slow to anger, should be slow to sue. Amen? Amen. I know it's going to be a silent Sunday, so, you know, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I don't care. But the point is this, Southwest, Christian people shouldn't take other Christian people to court. Very simple, okay? So all, all of us get that. Cognitively, that makes sense. And I think intellectually speaking and even morally speaking, we are consigned to this reality, okay? But what happens when you leave church and you fight in the parking lot and somebody run into your car and cause $20,000 worth of damage with another Southwest member and they ain't got no insurance. How does this verse feel now? <laughs> can, can I go further? You're two guys, you're in men's ministry and y'all growing in the Lord and you realize that, man, we got some of the same skill sets that can complement one another for business. Bro, let's Let's bring our stuff together. Let's make some money here with your fellow church member. And y'all go and get the contract notarized. And now you're making some money. But then three months in, homeboy skips town, breaks the contract, and you out 50 grand. How does this verse sound now? <laughs> Amen? Let me do one more. Uh, you're a single guy over here. She's a single girl over there. And after service today, y'all go out to party on the patio and you go to our little swag store, okay? And fella, you getting you some swag, but then you see homegirl and you put some swag on her. And you step to her like you knew her. And she starts batting her eyes at you. And you say, baby girl, heaven must be missing an angel because I'm seeing nothing but glory on your face. Come on, somebody. And y'all start dating and doing that boo thing stuff. And you say, can I go to Chick-fil-A after church with you? And she says, boy, it's closed, but let's go to Raising Cane's. And y'all fall in love. And they just bad eyes and got butterflies. And you even get Jenkins to do your wedding. And everything's wonderful and honky-dory. Then three months later, okay, the swag is out. <laughs> and you can't stand the sight of one another. No adultery. No one's left Jesus. But you want to go $500 to a lawyer to write up divorce papers. How does this verse, how does this verse feel now? So, so my point is this. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11 is easy to understand. It is not easy to apply. This is what I want you to hear. Most Christians see 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11 as true, but few accept it as right for them. So let's see then what God has to say for us because I hope you can see that you cannot acquiesce to what Paul is directing us to be about unless you first receive the revelation of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. So let's talk about the revelation of our passage. For now, I want you to just hear this. Are y'all okay? Everybody cool? Okay, relax, get over yourselves. Okay, you good? Okay. This is what I want you to hear more than anything else I'm going to say to you today. It is hard to embrace what God has called you to if you don't appreciate what God has delivered you from. Oh, I was hoping you would wake up right there. How many of you know that it's real hard to climb God's mountain until you remind yourself that God has delivered you from your valley? I know it's new people, but I've got to shout right there that when you think on the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, it propels you forward to obedience when you first look back and remind yourself of deliverance. So that's Paul's next move in the text. Don't you see it? It's about to get real good up in here. But in verse 7, he says, when Christians refuse to forgive each other and take matters to court. Look at he says what he says to church people. It's a defeat for you. Verse 5, he says, it's shame on you. Notice how far he takes you and I. He stretches us to unparalleled proportions when he says, Christian people who have Jesus in your heart, why not just suffer wrong? 
Why not literally be messed over? Paul, you are talking to Californians. How dare you? Why does Paul get to say that? Here it is. Because the gospel of Jesus, glory to God, when the love of Jesus starts to stir in your soul, the gospel moves you past considering just what that person did to you. It reminds you of what your sin did to God. It moves you past how they offended you and reminds you of how your sin offended God. Hey, glory, but in a daring move of grace and compassion, my Bible says 2,000 years ago, Jesus came down and he looked at my sin and then looked past my sin and he saw my need. I'm going to heaven today because Jesus didn't hold my sin against me. And now he's saying, you can show grace because Jesus showed you grace. Y'all smelling what I'm stepping in? Okay, so at the end of the day, Paul is calling us towards this more nobler, wonderful Christian ethic. So get the revelation. Y'all okay? Okay, all right, okay, okay. Listen, he reminds me in verse nine to get them the revelation of how they can do this. The way he does it, the move he makes is he says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he reminds them, verse 11, and such were some of you. What is he doing? You can show forgiveness to them when you remind yourself of forgiveness that God gave you. Y'all okay? So he's reminding Corinthian people of what they used to do and be. Now, I'm going to explain some of these words here because they just don't hit Californians like they hit Corinthians 2,000 years ago. So he says, notice, some of them, verse 9, were fornicators, okay? Your Bible may say sexually immoral. It's the Greek word, porneia, the word from which we derive our English word, pornography. This is speaking of illicit sexual sin. Understand that the biblical framework of fornication is not sexual intercourse outside of marriage, but it is any sexual immorality out of side of a covenant union between one biological male and one biological female. I speak of the M word, and I speak of soaking, and I speak of lust, and I speak of illicit acts on FaceTime. I speak of all this stuff is under the purview of fornication. And Paul says to church people, such were some of you. He says, some of you were idolaters, the temple of Aphrodite, one of the seven wonders of the world was right there in Corinth where the Greeks would come in and offer sacrifices to this pagan deity, Aphrodite. And because she was the goddess of fertility, they would often exploit themselves with sexual orgies in the worship of this false god. There were a thousand prostitutes who were employed at the temple. The average Greco-Roman man would have had a wife, one or two concubines, and varying series of relationships with different prostitutes right Right there at the temple. And Paul says, such were some of you. He says, some of you were thieves and robbers. Corinth was known as a pilfering population. You think you can leave your shoes somewhere at a baseball game? You sure couldn't do it. In Corinth, they were known for stealing things at the bathhouses. They would even steal your housekeeper in Corinth. And Paul says, such were some of you. He says, some of you were drunkards. It's the Greek word methos, which means uncontrolled drinking. He's not talking about a glass of Cabernet after a 16-ounce filet mignon at Ruth's Chris, you better ask somebody. He's talking about uncontrolled drinking. Alcohol has become your God. Greece was actually known as a very sober culture. In Corinth, everything changed. Even the children were often found being completely drunk in the daytime. And Paul says, and such were some of you. And then he says, you were revilers and you were swindlers. So Paul finishes the list saying, church, never forget where God brought you from. You were immoral. You practiced homosexuality. You were fornicators. You were swindlers. You were hustlers. You were thieves. You 
you were robbers, but is there anybody else glad about Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 that says, but God, hey, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I'll just shout by myself, Southwest, I once was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. So notice Paul says, what sense does it make for folks who've been through that kind of deliverance to hold a grudge against somebody in the world? Amen, somebody? You're not getting it. Uh, so guys, come out here and help me with this. Paul is saying that the Corinthians used to be hustlers and fornicators and grievous sinners. And so the idea is that before this pinning of this letter, there's three Corinthians on the block who don't know about Jesus and they are living in spiritual darkness. And then this old man named Paul starts preaching about some carpenter from Nazareth. And I can hear the old man saying that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And there was a drunkard there and there was a fornicator there who said this Jesus stuff sounds good. And they put their trust and faith in Jesus. And now they've moved from darkness to light. Now there's a hard-headed that didn't want nothing to do with Jesus, but those two got up in the church and they started getting the Holy Ghost filled. Where I come from, they used to say, I'm saved sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized. And now they got the word in them. And the Bible says, verse 11, that you are now washed in the blood of the Lamb. Meaning, my Bible says he's washed my sin and he's taken it away as far as the east is from the west. And I heard the Bible say that I will remember their sins. Hallelujah. No more. Then Paul says, some of you, when you put your faith in Jesus, you got justified, which means he gave me a new driver's license. The license no longer says sinner. It now says saint. That's my identification. And I heard the old theologian saying justification is just as if I have never sinned and just as if I have always obeyed. And anybody else glad that not only did he declare me righteous, but he's literally making me righteous. The Bible says now you are being sanctified, which means to make you holy holy day by day. We may not be perfect, but we are on our way to perfect. I may not be what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be. Bishop Ulmer used to say when I was a sinner and you cut me off on the road, I would cuss you flat out. But now that I got Jesus and you cut me off, I'll cuss you way less <laughs> because God is moving us forward. And I want to remind the church that you can show forgiveness because he's brought you from darkness to light. You've been washed. You've been justified. You've been sanctified. So now, what in the world kind of sense does it make when you and I get into it over something after all God has brought us through and take it back to this joker to decide on it? <laughs> who hadn't been washed who hadn't been sanctified who hadn't been justified Paul says makes no sense give it up for these two amen so let's close and land the plane let's get out of here okay uh, with four biblical reasons Christians shouldn't take other Christians to court, okay? Let me get some clarification here. Um, Paul is not insisting that all grievances are in-house grievances, okay? So there are some things that happen in the church that by law and by moral law require legal ramifications. So let me just say that, okay? And had that been the case in the text, Paul would have made that adaptation, okay? In history, churches have made the mistake for not taking stuff that should have gone to the law. Can I get a witness right there? I speak of embezzlement from spiritual leadership. 
I speak of abuse of any kind. I speak of sexual misconduct of any kind. And I just want to say here, God forbid, if it happens at this church, we call them the police and you go into the popos and you go into jail, jail in Jesus' name. <laughs> amen, somebody. Y'all should have said amen way louder than that. Amen, somebody. First two, he's talking about trivial cases. Can I say it? Stupid stuff that we ought to be able to work out, okay? California is the second li most litigious state in the nation, okay? More lawsuits here, second place than any other state in the union. We sue one another for anything. There's a case in SeaWorld. Um, there's a young man and his family who stayed behind and hid inside SeaWorld Park because he wanted to swim with the killer whales. And he waits till the park is closed, and he gets in the tub with the killer whales. Well, you'd be surprised to know the killer whale killed him. Because <laughs> you know what killer whales do? They kill people. And the family, God bless them, were just up in odds and furious with SeaWorld, okay? They sued him, and it reminds me of the time Siegfried and Roy's tigers bit them, and everybody got mad at the tiger. And Chris Rock said, that tiger didn't go crazy. That tiger went tiger. You know what I'm saying? So the killer whale went killer whale. And they said the grounds for it is that you guys put stuffed killer whales in the gift shop, which gave us this predisposition that killer whales are cuddly and nice. Okay? We'll sue for anything. There's another lady that sued the jelly bean company because the jelly beans had sugar in them. She was mad that jelly beans had sugar. Her argument was that, well, they called it a bean. Uh, there's another court case about a guy took a girl out on a date. Um, they're, they're watching Guardians of the Galaxy, which was his first problem, okay? But they're at a date watching Guardians of the Galaxy. Apparently, she texted on her phone too much. He sued her for wasting his movie ticket investment by, by, by being on the phone. Just great trivial cases. But if we're not careful, that bleeds into the church. So years ago over in the Iron Curtain, Eastern Europe, there's two Christian ministries, unbeknownst of one another, who are overseas, underground, smuggling Bibles, doing God's work. Then they found out that there was another ministry doing what they do, and they sued each other. Now, it's funny that they're suing each other for passing out Bibles that apparently they never read. So Paul says, consider biblical reasons on our way out. Let's go home on this. Number one, reasons you shouldn't take another Christian to court. Number one, the world often gets it wrong. Verse four says they have no standing in the church. Translation, they have no standing with Jesus. They don't love the Lord, okay? And so the Roman courts in this day and age were very corrupt. Usually only the rich and famous prevailed. Sound like anybody you know? <laughs> Amen, somebody? So Paul is making this point, church, okay? If that judge or that court or that uh, arraignment or that jury, if they don't have the love of Jesus, what are the chances of them applying the wisdom of Jesus? Amen? So the world often gets it wrong. Number two, Christian lawsuits make us spiritually weaker not stronger. So the whole idea is, Paul says, this is to your shame. Translation, this doesn't make you strong. This makes you weak. Get it. Adversarial proceedings are predisposed in such a way that they encourage me not to forgiveness and reconciliation, but they, they, they encourage me to focus on the one thing you did wrong and the one thing I did right and make those two aspects the only story. Amen. So what, what, what law courts do, right, because you're trying to win, not do what's right. You're trying to win. What's a lawyer trying to do? Not the lawyers in this church, but all the other ones. <laughs> Amen? They're trying to win. They don't care about what's right. And so my whole idea is that they take that one thing and make a caricature of you. I was at the fair a couple of weeks ago, and they're drawing these these families, you know, the crazy caricatures of these families. What does the artist do? They take one aspect of your face and they make it the most prominent thing, right? So if you got a nozzle, they turn it into a schnozzle, <laughs> right? If you got ears, they turn you into Dumbo. You know what I'm saying? And, and what, what, is it, what, what does that happen in the law course? 
the law courts end up making you tempted to create one aspect that's off and exaggerate it to no end. That doesn't make us spiritually stronger. That makes us spiritually weaker. Thirdly, lawsuits in the church are beneath us. In verse 3, he says, do you not know that you will judge the whole world? You'll even judge fallen angels. Revelation 20, verse 4 says, in the end times, hallelujah, when the Son of Man returns to set eternally what is right and wrong, we, the beloved of God, will be with him. And I think, we don't know exactly what judging looks like, but I think it'll be this. He is the only righteous judge, but we'll be the chorus of the heavenly host saying, this is right. Amen, Father. Amen. Hallelujah to your name, for you do all things rightly. The point is this. In the future, you and I are going to do some amazing stuff together. So Paul's saying, and when we get into it, let's figure out how to do some amazing stuff together now by showing forgiveness one to another. Y'all with me? Amen? Lastly, we got to go home. Raising canes, here we come. The biggest one is that the church loses her witness. Everyone looking this way, I'm closing. Okay, somebody can come out, start playing something emotional, okay? <laughs> the world already thinks, what of the church? That we're nasty, that we're hypocrites, that we're mean, that we gossip, that we backbite. Guess what happens when we sue each other and take each other to court? Guess what the world says? I knew it. That's all they ever were. So this is why Paul can say, forgive each other. Why not try that? Right. Stay with me, because this is hard. Because if somebody hits you out there, you're going to forget everything. <laughs> so what, what's the anchor in the soul? Paul says, try forgiving them. And then he says, this is an audacious request. He says, why not suffer wrong? And he says it as if it's easy. Right. <laughs> Low key, I'm like, Paul, why don't you suffer wrong? <laughs> but then Paul's like, yeah, I went to prison twice and they chopped my head off, so. Mm. <laughs> why not be defrauded? How does he get to do that? Watch it. Paul's not looking at the peace that they're trying to get out of this earthly verdict. Paul's reflecting on the peace they already have through an eternal verdict. Paul's saying, the peace you think you need from an earthly judge is a peace you already have from a heavenly judge. And Paul's saying, if you just cool your fan and hold your horses and think less about what they did to you and more about what you did to God, but the verdict came back not guilty, saved by the blood of the Lamb, then he says, you can suffer wrong. Uh, 2019. Help me close this out. 2019, um, me and April were renting here in the desert, and um, we got into it with our landlord, and that's all I, I'm going to say. And uh, can I just say it frankly? I was right. <laughs> can I go further? They were wrong. Okay. <laughs> but a professing Christian... And we were in contention, couldn't work it out. They said, y'all owe us $3,500. We said, not only do we not owe you $3,500, you owe us this, you owe us this, you know. Boom, 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 missing each other. And then I got a subpoena in the mail to go to a small claims court. Guess what week I was supposed to appear for, for the judge for arraignment? Easter. And the stress, remember this? The stress, I feared embarrassment for our church. I feared it began, I was, I was spazzing out and we were praying morning, noon, and night. That parking lot right there, she drives up in the middle of the day. She says, come outside. I'm like, what you want? Come outside. And I'm sitting in the car with her 
she opens up her Bible and she reads 1 Corinthians 6, 7. She says, why not us just suffer wrong and trust God to fix all the rest? And I'm telling you, if I wouldn't have read it, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Made a call that night, hey, so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. And guess what I did next? I apologize for something I didn't do. And she went, oh, thank you, Pastor Jenkins. Wrote the check, sent it off. Now, that check cost me something. But the peace we had after that phone call yeah. was worth 10 times more. So true. Amen? Amen. 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 Whatever's going on between you and that other believer, ask God for the power to let it go. You, you can do this through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let it go. Honey, move on with your life. Yes. Boy, move on with your life. And God will fix everything in the end. Amen. You need prayer. Stop at the tables on your way out. If you need counsel, we're here for you. But until then, this week, live for Jesus. Open up your hands this way. Southwest, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And we ask this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and the church said. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a good week, everybody.